The following program will make you want to grow things and experience new and wonderful dreams about your plants, garden, and garden design. Listener participation is always strongly advised. Good evening and welcome to you Down the Garden Path with your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101. To get on board in the Toronto GTA area of Southern Ontario, Canada, dial 905-725-1907. Toll free in North America, 1-866-905-1907. 7325 Worldwide 1866 656 5477 Send us an email right now. Our email address is in studio101 at gmail.com. And now, right to your host of Down the Garden Path. Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. Thank you and welcome everyone to this episode of Down the Garden Path, where each week we discuss down-to-earth tips and advice for your plants, gardens, and landscapes. As landscape designers and gardeners, we think it is important and possible to have great gardens that are low maintenance and we want to help you make it happen. I am Joanne Shaw, landscape designer and owner of Down to Earth Landscape Design for the past 11 years. It is currently a design-only business here east of the GTA in uh, Toronto, Canada, Ontario. Here we go. And with me is my co-host, Matthew Dressing. Welcome, Matthew. Welcome, Joanne. Good evening, everyone. I am Matthew Dressing, horticulturist and landscape designer and owner of Natural Affinity Designs. Mm -hmm. Natural Affinity is a landscape design and garden maintenance firm servicing Toronto and the eastern GTA. Joanne and I enjoy doing Down the Garden Path each week, bringing you interesting, relevant, and helpful topics to help you achieve a great garden. We learn right along with you from each other, from our research, and from the guests that join us here on the show. As always, we welcome your questions via social media or emails. That's right. And we want to thank you, as always, for joining us here down the garden path. And we want you to know that um, we do release this uh, live show as a podcast. So you can always check out past shows of Down the Garden Path on your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to be notified of new content. And please like, share, and even leave us a comment, which we would love. So thank you very much. Um, for doing that. Yes, thank you. Definitely yeah. tune in. And lots of past uh, past shows. So as soon as you log it on to your, uh, p your app, you're going to see all of our past shows. That's right. Right? And this show. Mm -hmm. What are we talking? Well, it's the last month. It's the last Monday of the month. That's right. It's August. So it's August in the garden. And August can be a challenging month. The heat is unrelenting. The weeds are growing strong. And our plants can start to look a little tired or spent. And as gardeners, it can sometimes be difficult to be a little tired and spent, uh, to get a little tired and spent ourselves. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm working outside regularly. Yeah. And it's been a hot one. So tonight we're going to go over some of the common challenges, the challenges of August, mm -hmm. uh, what we face and how we're going to overcome them in these unrelenting, brutal, hot months. Excellent. So we'll yeah. August, tricks. August, we always look forward to August, but then when it gets here, I think we're all like a little gardened out, aren't we? Yes. You know, and, and things start to go wrong or I'm, we're unsure of things. Um, 
Yeah. So it's good to uh, to good to find out what what we can do to make it easier. What we can do so we can just hang out and relax and enjoy August like we always were. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. We've got oh. a message already from Elise. Uh, one word for the GTA is water. Oh my goodness. We oh. hope it rains. We need some rain. I don't know where everybody else, all our listeners are from, but uh, here in the GTA and surrounding areas, uh, we need some water. We do. And it's looked threatening. In the, especially I know. In the and, afternoon. The, and the weathermen have said it's going to happen. Yep. They said it was supposed to happen on Sunday. Yeah. Yesterday just gave us, uh, it didn't rain where I was at, at work. And then I got about two blocks to the east and it had poured for all of like five seconds. Oh, geez. And everything was soaked. There were big puddles and it just turned itself off. And yeah. it was like, oh, darn. It's not enough. It's no. not enough. Or please come I back. <laughs> so I yeah, know. we definitely need some rain. The yeah. lawns are looking dry. Plants are looking a little tired. And the, the wind, it's been windy as well. Yeah. And it's been a steady breeze. And mm-hmm. we know that the wind can be just as drying and desiccating as the sun. For sure. So now we got both and heat. So For sure. So our tips for water, since uh, Lisa's kind of started us off with our first biggest challenge of the season or of the episode, not the season, <laughs> <laughs> um, water, remember to water deeply. I think that's our biggest mistake. I think everybody thinks they need to just go out. Um, even my boys have been watering the vegetable garden with watering cans and just like a little bit of water to each plant. And our cucumbers are not gr- like compared to the last two years, cucumbers are n- really not doing much. So I, I said, no, you know, we really need the hose and really needs don't need to water as often but we need to really deep water whether it's our vegetables or our other newly planted trees shrubs that perennials water less often but deeper would you say i agree completely and exactly uh don't and don't forget about the window boxes in your containers right oh. i mean they're exposed on the sides they're going to get the sun on their they're sides tougher though up. you kind of almost have to do them more often you too. do yeah but don't forget to water them them deeply and, and don't just when they're dry, don't just go out and water them and then watch the water come out and walk away. Oh, true. Do it and then and let that soak in a bit. Water that deep and let it soak in and then come back and give it another water. Right. Almost it. water them twice. Right, right. right. You want to give them a nice watering twice. So the second time you'll notice the water doesn't pour out like it did the first time. Mm-hmm. And that's the water of those plants, that second watering they're going to drink, that deep watering they're going to drink again. Okay. Yeah. I had a guest today at the garden center. Um, he came in, there were things all over his tree, it was kind of going all weird and brown and patchy here and there. And well, Which kind know, of tree? Uh, it was actually a harlequin maple. Oh, yeah. okay. And uh, he said, you know, I, well, I've got an irrigation system and it, it comes on superficially. So we, we talked about that, obviously. Like, and what do you mean superficially? Like it just comes, he had it setting on for like five minutes, like okay. w- once a night. Kind of thing. Okay. And I was like, oh, well, they might need a little bit more. They're, they are kind of established plants you've got there. But the, okay. And I gave him some recommendations and kind of what we were talking about, too. And um, he looked at his tree and I said, well, we were trying to figure out what it was. And then we narrowed it down. It was just it was leaf scorch. He was he was watering this 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 tree. Right. But he wasn't watering it deep enough. So it was OK during the spring. Oh, I thought you said he was watering the leaves. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Okay, wasn't Just, watering the leaves. Right. Okay. He was he was watering the tree. It was only a number of like it was like five years old. I think okay. it was. But he had stopped watering it because he let the irrigation water it for five minutes uh, for like that inch or not even really right. like five minutes. Yeah. So the the tree was losing so much water to the heat in the environment that it was starting to scorch out. Right. Again, he's like, oh. Yeah, look, and I showed him some literature, and he's like, "That's exactly what's happening." And uh, all the solutions—that's what it is. So that deep watering he was missing, and that—that, that, yeah, we need deep yeah. watering. We can't have like a glass of water or a water bottle, right, and go through for a week before we have water again. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So we got our plants need a nice deep water. And that, and with trees, I kind of go back to the did you sell my tree bag? Because I, honest to goodness, I swear those are the best things. You know what? I showed him a tree bag. Okay. And I showed him the root feeder. And he wanted the root feeder. So okay. we bought a root feeder and that nice deep root feeding and okay. showed him how to do it. He was excited because oh, he knew he was going to get his tree back. So. Yeah, for sure. And so the root bag, the tree bags are great <gasps> they um, are. because I think, it, you know, I, as much as we try to say, leave, you know, set your phone or set a timer mm-hmm. so that you leave the hose running and then you ch- move the hose from place to place, we're all too busy for that. So I just yeah. feel, feel like... I've got, you know, three or four trees that need needs that amount of water in my yard. So I just move the tree bag 
Um, and then I, t- I, many of our listeners, past listeners know I'm a bit of a tree bully, watering bully. Mm-hmm. So then I'll put the bag on my neighbor's tree and then just say, OK, <laughs> you need to water. They know they need to water. So, you know, you can with even with one bag, you can accomplish a lot. Oh, yeah. Those bags yeah. are, are fantastic for sure. And even your city trees. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Don't forget about your boulevard trees. Yeah. Those are your responsibility. Yes, for sure. Yes. For sure. And Bob has written in and he says, I know two inches is the magic number, but how do we know if it is enough? I would say it's tricky in these, these, uh, like two inches I think is fine for the lawns, but I don't think that's fine for the plants. Do you? I was going to say two two inches to three inches. That's what I come up with when I think of like watering the lawn or a flatter surface or, uh, but even like window boxes or perennials, right? Their root zones are so much bigger than, than the two inches. So Bob, you can, you can leave them to dry out slightly in between. Don't ever let them go really bone dry. Um, but you do want to give that whole root zone a nice, deep, thorough wetting. Yeah, for sure. So, and it, and it might be deeper than two inches. If you've planted a brand new tree, if you think of the pot, the soil and the root ball, that's like um, 12 to 18 inches, depending on the size of the pot that you right. bought. Yes. But most of the roots are in the core to the bottom of that pot. So two inches won't won't do it. And the upper two inches of the soil, especially when it's exposed, will always dry out to the, the environment, to the wind, to the sun, to the, the light inside the house, going to the tropical example. Okay. Um, so just, yeah, know your plant. Know what it does prefer. Does it like to be really wet? Does it like to dry out in between? Is it a succulent um, or like a money tree kind of thing or does it like to be more evenly moist regularly so just just knowing your plant as well two inches again we don't know um, Bob what uh, your situation is or what plants you might be referring to or in mind but yeah two inches might but usually it there's it's the root ball you want to fill in and it's that volume of water at least once uh, when she's on the drier side and a second time uh, for the to get her that water, that second water is really what she's going to fatten up and unwilt with. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So hopefully that answers your question. Mm-hmm. Um, Bob, if you had another plant or a situation in mind, we'd love to, to discuss it with you. But yeah. hopefully that answers your question. Excellent. Speaking of so water, oh, and if we kind of, like, I don't know. I, don't I think so. But Brian writes in. Oh. Um, how do these tree bags work? Oh, so thank you. I'll throw that back to I you. I know. You're going to throw <laughs> that back to me. I, I mean, you, I know if you drive around, you kind of see them. So they are kind of a double-sided bag um, with teeny tiny, like you can't even really see the holes, Brian. They're so small. And um, it zips the one side of it. Uh, it has a zip. Both sides have a zipper. So you basically mm. wrap it around the trunk of the tree and literally zip it up. And then on the side opposite, a side of the bag opposite the zipper at the very top, there's going to be a tag and there's some handles. Um, and there's like a little slit in the bag. And basically you use put the hose in that slit and kind of fill the bag up. It's about 15 gallons yep. of water in that uh, bag. But the thing is, it now will fill and kind of compass uh, like the root ball or the base of the tree. But then it takes like eight or nine hours to yeah. water that tree. So it really gives it a really good deep watering. And uh, yeah, so it's it's excellent. And I was doing some reading about it, just even for newly p- planted trees, mm-hmm. um, mature trees. I mean, even my son noticed he couldn't believe how our city trees um, that we lost a, y- a few years ago when the ice storm and they were ash trees compared to our like you know b- compared to my neighbors across the street who had their trees replaced at the same exact time. But our three city trees are way like two years. They you would swear there was two years difference in planting. Nice, and that is. And I said to him, why do you think that is? And he said, because you water your trees. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. And yep. really, it's the water bag is so nice because it's a no brainer. So like last night I watered one tree and this morning we took it off and put it on another tree. And tomorrow, I'm, if I remember tonight when I get home, I'll put it on another tree. So it uh, it really makes it easy. Mm-hmm. And do you use a certain I know there's a couple different models. Yeah, but I've gotten Tree Gator, which is, I think, what the, your garden center sells as well, right? right? And I was yeah. just going to say to Brian, yeah. So Tree Gator tends to be kind of the, I would almost say industry standard okay. or like the big yeah. name mm-hmm. or the most common name at least. So yeah, Brian, if you uh, Google Tree Gator, G-A-T-O-R. They really need to be a sponsor. We really need a sponsor. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're going to write them. We'll write yeah. them at the end <laughs> of the show. Um, if you look at them, you can see them and, and there's lots of great information, but... Uh, 
I have to echo Joanne. I mean, they're they're fantastic. They're yeah. re- they really are. More people need to know about them. It yeah, just takes they do. the ease out of everything. Because I don't know, everybody, I mean, I leave the sprinkler on and I forget about it and yeah. I've watered, I've wasted water. I've, you know, that type of thing. So this really helps me, you know, if we have to use water to water our trees, then at least we know it's going to where it's supposed to be. Um, I had a question about the one thing I think I'd like to get is the w- one that's for evergreens. That's a bit more of a donut than a bag. And do I, you sell that one? We do. We sell you, a few of them. The, okay. the bigger one is is uh, more popular. The, okay. That's like the Gator Junior. Okay. Uh, or or the, the, that's the model that comes to mind. And yeah, it's like a big donut. It's really flat. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of, it's instead of green, it's more of like a taupey purple kind oh, of color okay. with red accents on it. Yeah, yeah. It does the same thing. Because it is trickier to, I can't wrap it around my evergreen. Right. So I was standing it up and kind of filling it. But then I find that the, I don't think the pressure, like the water doesn't come out. Right. So then I was like constantly, so it took three days to water my uh, Dawn Redwood because I'm like constantly having to reposition the bag. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, this isn't working. So I think uh, it would be worth it um, for for to have one of those as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, they're nice and flat, and you can use them around newly planted perennials because you can you don't have to like co- completely surround it, right? Right. You can, so they're they're really neat. The yeah. Tree Gator Junior, if you're googling, okay. it, I believe it is. A follow up question: Chris writes in. Uh, just wanted to say hello. Hey, Chris. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Love your radio show, especially this time of year. Thank you very much, and thanks for tuning in this evening. Uh, and are the tree bags expensive? Thanks. I know. Uh, are they like thirty bucks? Yeah, about I was gonna say that? I, 30, 35 dollars. I think thirty five is what we sell them for. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and they're quite tall when you stand them up. I mean, they're they're like what do you say? Would you say two feet, two and a half? Feet? Yeah, yeah, and they don't but go bad. I mean, so no, no. I mean, I've I've had mine three years now, and I just I don't see why I would stop using it. No, nope. because even yep. I um I have friends. Where like and I give them to my clients too when when they're when I'm selling them trees and so I had really good friends of mine uh, say you know well my trees are doing great it's been two years I should give you back the bag and I'm like no 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 you keep that bag <laughs> and I said now you've got you know you've got your Japanese maple in the front yard you've got your city tree and they're like really we can use it on that I said absolutely yeah. so I think uh, it's it's compared to that thirty five dollars compared to how much water I used to just waste <gasps> oh, yeah. down the sewer. Yeah, it's a, it's peanuts for sure, mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. So I think that I think we've covered watering. Have I we think covered so water? too? <laughs> we can, who knew we could do a whole episode on watering? Uh, everybody, that <laughs> might have to be another show. <laughs> watering, that's right, as I make that's a note. Right. So yeah, battling the the summer heat and the drought definitely watering deep. Um, you know, there's a lot of tools, the tree bags for sure. We're mm-hmm. definitely, I think, uh, you, especially you're a champion of that tree gator. Uh, I am. Sure. I Keeping am a it, champion. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that kind of beats the, the heat and the drought. Just watering deeply. If you water deeply, you don't have to water as frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, roots are smart. They will pull up and they will go where the water is and then they'll burn out. The lawn is a classic example. Yeah. You water shallow, the roots are shallow. Uh, and that just basically will stresses them out. So, yeah. So water deeply. Excellent, excellent. So the other thing, and you had your show. I missed you last week, but you did yeah. a show on uh, Japanese beetles. Uh, and I did. you did. How did it go? I I thought it went well. Excellent, excellent. It's not up on your podcast though. No. It's not. <laughs> but it will be this. Uh, this week will be a double week. Hopefully, yes. if I can get my act together. Two new episodes. <laughs> Two new episodes will be out this week because we know a lot of people are having issues with the uh, Japanese beetle. Yes. Um, I had my own neighbor, I don't know if she's listening, um, exclaim by how many, she can't believe how many she's getting in her backyard. Mm. And she literally is holding a grocery bag full of dead beetles. And I'm like, mm-hmm. her yard's not that big. I'm, and I'm kind of questioning her further. Yeah, she put three traps in her backyard. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we do not. So more is not. This is one of those instances where more traps, more is not better, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, yes, correct. There are lots of them out there. The beetles. They right. they are numerous. They are invading. They yes. are an invasive species. Um, but yes, she so took all mine because I don't have any. So she's got mine, <laughs> and she probably does. Yeah, because that's how the Japanese beetles work. So um, last week I was saying how they all release that scent, that pheromone that we kind of mimic in the traps, and with three lures there, which are 
are designed to overpower even a large colony of Japanese beetles, they are getting the signal that when they get that whiff, that there's a massive group right over okay. here, and they're gonna pull. They're gonna pull in. They they usually do only do like a uh, fifteen to twenty foot the baggy ones, like, right? Like a radius of only like fifteen to twenty feet or. Which is all but, you need. So you all don't, you need. yeah. Right. So I think some people that buy the one or don't buy them because they think, oh, I'm going to get my whole neighborhood's beetles in my trap. And that's not the case. No. If you have one and you have a normal size backyard, you know, your 30 by 50 backyard, one is plenty, right? Right. right? Because most of that yard is also not garden. So, you know, really you're just pulling from the garden. Um, but in her case, by putting three w- lures in, she's just kind of OD'd on it. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 concentration of pheromone was like a gravity well just with everything just it just drew them all in right yeah it just sucked them all in because that's all they really look for yeah so we'd love to hear from you i hope you enjoyed matthew's episode um when i was away and uh if you have any other questions about uh japanese beetles and nematodes Mm -hmm. and i'm not sure what else you covered i wasn't listening yeah no yeah we talked yeah (laughs) you were on the garden walk and we're gonna talk i was yes we'll talk about that near the end of the show i know we missed it at the beginning um but we will talk. I was away in Buffalo touring garden, so it was kind of not a vacation. Uh, that my designer friend that was with me said it was professional development. So we were on a PD day That's or three day or three. <laughs> so we were <laughs> gone for three days. So uh, so that was fun. Uh, so definitely want to share about that yeah. and check out my. I shared a ton of pictures on social media. So take a look at uh, Instagram or especially Facebook, the Down to Earth. Uh, landscape design facebook page has tons of photos so yeah yeah Yeah. so last week we talked about just trapping them and uh, how the sprays work and nematodes and chinch bug because people are buying um coming in and they're looking for nematodes for grubs because they've got the grub damage but it's actually chinch damage because they do the same damage oh okay right so okay we kind of heard about that so So, yeah so that is a good episode and stay tuned for it shortly this week if you missed it Excellent. And I think we had another picture. Gary, did someone send us a picture of a plant? I think this is another August heat dilemma. Yeah, Jody's written. Oh, Jody sent it. Oh, we got a picture. Did you know, everybody, that you can email us a photo? So you can email us questions at instudio101 at gmail.com. But we love photos. Yes. So although we know it's radio and you can't see the photo. but uh, <laughs> yeah. So this one is leaves. It looks like hydrangea leaves. Some are green and some are very green and yellow. Yes. And it's not a variegated plant, is it? No, it's not. No, it's not no. a variegated plant. It's got a, a good mix. It kind of looks like it's a little bit of everywhere and on the top of the leaves for sure, or on the top of the plant area for sure. Um, my thought initially is uh, an iron deficiency mm. of, of some sort. Okay. Um, and it's a kind of a close-up of picture, so we can't see everything. Uh, but yeah, it definitely looks more of like, an. it's definitely a nutrient deficiency. I would guess iron okay. um, by the placement and the intervenal chlorosis of it. Yes, definitely. Definitely, you could see all the veins in the leaves. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of I, I. It is a nutrient deficiency, but I always love the pattern on it. Yes, it does. It is pretty, <laughs> pretty. But um, can that be corrected quickly, or is it something like what we put on now will help it next year? Yeah, so you can you can kind of do both. Um, you want to usually add iron in the form of iron chelate. Okay. Or, or chelated or chelated or it whatever. Sounds, it looks say. like chelate, right? It does look like just C H E L A T. Yeah. Yeah. I say chelate. But, uh, and is that water soluble? It is water soluble. So you can do it as in uh, water soluble. You can do it as a foliar spray. So you can oh. mix it up and spray it right on. <gasps> yes. And I've heard. The of one exception where we can spa- spray the leaves? The one of oh, the exceptions my goodness. where we can spray our okay. leaves. Okay. Right. But then we need a hose end sprayer that didn't have nematodes in it. And yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or you could, you could mix it in a, just a clean uh, one liter spray bottle. Oh, you could do okay. It. Okay. It might be a little bit more laborious, but okay. you, you would do it. Um, and that will do, <laughs> that will do uh, a quick, that's going to be your, like your quick fix. So the iron is going to be absorbed. <laughs> it's going to relieve some of the symptoms uh, and make it look green again and kind of give a boost okay. to, to the plant. But you do want to mix some into the soil. Okay. Uh, and there'll be instructions depending on the brand and who's made it for you. Uh, it's so many tablespoons per, you know, okay. X square meters and you or, or X square meters or feet. And do you, you work tomorrow? Uh, no, oh, yes, you inventory, do? but oh. I don't have any. Oh, oh you don't have any? <laughs> I don't have any. I, they, they, yeah, there's been a couple um, uh, iron deficiencies we've seen as of late 
I'm not sure why. Okay. Um, or or where around in the cities they've been, and they should be asking. But uh, I am totally sold out. A lot of people are either using it as foliar sprays, or oh. and they're they're working it into the soil. Okay. And that'll actually uh, give you back the iron pellets. Well, not like pellets, but just yeah. the ions of iron that are sit there, and they'll slowly back release back and reestablish. Okay. Into the soil. And adding compost or manure, helpful, not helpful. Uh, Depends on the content of the... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, everything's made a little differently. Right. But it's better to just go shock it with iron. Yeah. If you've got a heavy iron deficiency, like it looks like Jody does. Okay. um, Or might. uh, Yeah. She's probably going to get better results with a quick, uh, like a blast of a foliar spray, but also putting some more back into the soil. Okay. Well, there you go, Jody. Yes, hopefully that helps. Yeah. And uh, thank you for writing in. Yeah, thank you for sending us a photo. We've never had a photo before. I know. It's great to say. Like, it really helps. So (laughs) thank you, everybody. Please keep that in mind that you can send us a photo. That's right. Yeah. In studio 101 at gmail.com. Photos, questions. Yeah. Um, Design dilemmas. You know, exactly. you name it. We we want to see the plants. Pictures are worth a thousand That's words. That's right. As we say on radio <laughs> or, or on the radio. Um, speaking of questions, we've got Dawn. Dawn is writing in. Uh, hi, Joanne and Matthew. Love the show. Thank you very much. And I do have another question about that tree bag. Um, I see that the bags are only good for trees with a maximum diameter of four inches. Any bags available that you know of for full-grown trees, that is, trees with a larger diameter trunks, 12, 18, 24 inches. So, you can go for it. No, 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 you go ahead. I was going to just say, yeah, that I don't think they make a specific one for the, the individual bag. Um, is best for that four, and I've seen them on six and eight inch ranges, and right. you don't want to strangle the tree or get it too tight. However, as Joanne was mentioning earlier, the double zippers, mm-hmm. one bag can zip to two to three to four to five bags. Yeah, as, so as it ends up being, really yeah, want. so Don, it's a little bit more expensive because now you got to buy two bags, but that's right. a solution, right? So you right. can zip this. So if you have, especially if you have a combination of um, mature trees and new trees, then if you have two bags for the mature trees, you just zip the bags together. Right. And so it's a much bigger circle. I don't know that you'd have to fill it as... You could. You fill you them both as, right. as much, or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And well, it's a more mature tree, so yeah. I was going to say, it probably does need that much water. Yeah, it probably water does. biomass. Yeah, so now you're watering two bags, like you're filling two bags, but they're now attached uh, to each other, so it's one big one big bag. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen five put together. Have you really? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And it was just a round of, like, kind of like what Dawn was saying, just like a bigger tree. Yes. And I think they were just kind of showing them off. In the, oh, okay. It was a botanical garden a number oh, okay. of years ago. And yeah. So, but it, it was kind of, it was pretty cool. But, yeah, it's like $100 worth yeah. plus of bags. So there but you go, Dawn. I hope that helps. Be- yeah. And it's true. Like, if especially if you've got a mix of a mature, you know, sometimes your boulevard tree is much more mature and your uh, your own trees in your yard are m- smaller. So you can have two bags and then uh, you can water your small trees, you know, two at a time and then your, your mature tree or sometimes vice versa, right, if you're in a new subdivision. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad that makes sense. Thank you for the question, Don. Thank you for listening, too. Yes, thank you. And you only have one bag, right? I do. I have okay. only I only have one bag. But I know we just planted, uh, one of my clients in Stouffville, we planted 22 trees. Now, most of them were kind of in the forest, some hemlocks and stuff, and into like native trees, into native forests, which I think would be fine. But the ones that are getting a ton of sun, so I actually, um, she has four bags. So I said, you know, you need to keep moving these bags around and that the irrigation also needed to remind her that the irrigation was for the lawn and not for the trees. So Yes. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Definitely, definitely worth it. And if we have any contractors or landscapers listening, then it is worth throwing in in or charging your client for including that in the price of your tree, that type of thing. So mm-hmm. definitely, definitely, definitely. They're we're gonna have to get them as a sponsor. I honestly. know. I know. We're gonna have to Seriously. do some homework. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what other challenges do we have in the August Garden? In the August Garden? Uh, well, um, I think one that we were talking about before and we've seen a lot about recently, especially in social media, is weeds. Yes. And I think uh, more specifically, we were looking and we're hearing a lot about... Am I allowed about to send an email? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a photo of my weeds. Yeah, Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> uh, but the dog strangling vine. Yes. Right? So mm-hmm. we've got a lot of that uh, going around. You can see it, especially in the GTA. Mm-hmm. Um, going back, I was talking about in Chicago when I had gone a, f- a couple weeks ago. That was one of the things that surprised me is I'm so used to in the GTA seeing dog strangling vine. 
out just in our fields and along yeah. the road. They didn't have any? Not a lick past Sarnia. I How? couldn't believe it. I have no clue. But no, I got that chemical. No, it's not. It's resistant to chemicals unless they've got something. Right, right. Exactly. All so. right. If you're in Chicago and you're listening, what are you putting on your dog's strangling vine? That's and it. And it's probably killing you too. But anyway. <laughs> and to the uh, to other U.S. listeners, do you guys have dog or strangling vine? Yeah, you know, have that's you seen true too. Yeah. It? Please Google it if you don't know what it is. Um, Give it a quick Google and let us know if you have it. Mm. It, uh, you know, s- several reasons why it's bad. I mean, one, it, it really does strangle everything out. Yes. Um, two, it also is uh, bad for the pollinators because it happens to be also in loosely related distant cousin of milkweed. Yes. And so it does fool the butterflies and they will lay their eggs on it. And then the little caterpillars hatch and they can't eat the... They can't eat it. Yeah. So it's it's bad that way. And the pods, when they open, are much like the you know milkweed f- in that one pea pod size pod has millions of seeds in it, right? Yes. Like dandelion on steroids. So if you guys yeah. are worried about those dandelions going to seed, then oh my goodness, these are brutal. But they're fairly, um, until that happens, they're fairly innocuous. So people don't really pay attention. Yeah. And so I'm like literally now, like even on walks, I at least pull them out so that the, <laughs> like, so that the, um, you know, the pods don't open. Um, but I was watching, uh, there's a video online, uh, Paul Zamet from the yes. Toronto Botanical Gardens. Did you see that information video? Yeah. So everyone Google, especially if you're in the GTA or in Ontario, um, Dog strangling vine. Um, look at look up Paul Zamet or Toronto Botanical Gardens. He did a really good video. And so what they're recommending, because of course they've got tons of property there, and yeah. they're in the middle of the city, and they're having a hard time keeping up with it. And they found that it actually is better to cut it, mm-hmm. um, which is what I've always said about goutweed too. It's just better to rob it of its photosynthesis. That pulling it actually makes more baby, maybe more babies. Right. Oh, maybe babies, <laughs> more babies. Um, so that, uh, you know, I don't necessarily walk around with a pair of scissors, though, <laughs> when no. I'm uh, when I'm dealing with the dog strangling vine out for a walk. But uh, I may start carrying my little uh, pruners with keep me. your little second. Yeah, my going. little. So that's something, you know, just keep an eye on it. It grows between neighbors. Ooh. It grows under fences. The cracks um, in the sidewalks, yeah. along fences, everywhere. Yes. It'll get in there. And and it's not go it's not easy to eradicate. So it with kind of a team effort. Right. And like you were saying, um, it is chemical resistant. So here in Canada, our roundup will not work mm-hmm. on the dog strangling vine. It is immune or nearly immune to Roundup. It barely phases it. Yeah. So it's that kind of an invasive weed. If if we have the Japanese beetles in the insect world, the plant world has dog strangling vine. There right you now. go. It's it's that bad. So that's why so. they're number one and number two on the August challenges of the August <laughs> in the Garden uh, episode. Plants, insects, watering nature herself. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So definitely, yeah. Uh, um, you know, cut it down. Pull off those pods if you can't. If you got lots of it, just make sure that those pods don't go to seed. Just take them off. Pull them off. Um, and that's what I'm recommending as well to one of some of our other guests um, and other people that I've been talking to. Because one of the other weeds we tend to see and deal with right now, in uh, especially in our lawn spaces, is our crab grasses. Mm-hmm. So we see those go to flower as well. And crab grasses are an annual grass. So unlike the dog strangling vine, winter will kill this one fairly easily. Uh, but she lets out lots and lots and lots of seeds. I've read, read where the counts are as high as uh, 600 plus seeds per plant. Uh, and imagine the number of grass crab grasses that you end up having. So as they tend to bloom um, and they come out and s- send out those little flower heads, they're kind of low. They get a little purpley as they open. That's the, the, the shade of the stems and the flowers start to grow. Right. Just, uh, you know, take your your little whippersnipper and just go out and just treat those little areas and just shave them off. Just turn it to 60 degree angle and just kind of cut them off and just let the whipper snipper. You don't have to grind out the grass. You don't have to pick it because um, the winter is about to kill it. I know, but it, I find it, I guess I have some big patches in my lawn. Yes. And that can be the challenge. Yes, yeah. So I felt like I needed to kind of get down on my hands and knees and kind of pick it out. 
um, because I think it does get ahead when it's so thick. And then when it does go to seed and then the lawnmower, like I think that's what's happening, right? So then the lawnmower goes over it mm-hmm. and then I'm spreading the seeds for next year. Exactly. So I don't know. I kind of disagree a little bit. We never okay. disagree usually. but We um, never do usually. Yeah, but, but that's okay. um, We can disagree. Yeah, we can disagree. <laughs> but I think in some cases, although I have to say I was almost picking, like, picking so much out that now I have bare grass in those spots. Right. And now the grass, that crabgrass was out competing other weeds. Yes. Now those seeds may or may not start to take over. And they yeah. may be crabgrass. They may be something else. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, yeah. So it was, I watered the area and just was really trying to pinch down and kind of pull Because they were baby, they yeah. were kind of baby crabgrass. Like it ha- certainly hadn't gone to seed yet. Yeah. They were little young ones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's easy to take care of is those little ones. Yep. Well, not when there's that much of it, but okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It totally depends on, on what you've yes, got. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Now, um, the other thing about the crabgrass is that we can treat it with, uh, a pre- what's the what's it called? I know. Oh, my corn gosh. Corn gluten? Thank you. Yes. No, but it's a pre-emergent. Yeah, the corn gluten is a pre-emergent. Pre, that's, isn't it pre-emergent something? Pre-emergent? Oh. No. Not just that I know. Okay. I just call it pre 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 emergent herbicide. Is that maybe okay? The word you're maybe for? maybe. Okay. Yes. Okay. So it's so, and I've heard people say, "Oh, I tried it once and it didn't work." But that's the thing with the corn gluten, right? right. Is you can't just try it once. Right. right. And I know I haven't tried it. I keep talking about trying it, but I haven't <laughs> tried it. Um, so, is it when can we do it? Yeah. Usually, you're going to want to do it later in the season. Okay. So, we're, fall is the best time for our grass seed, for putting that down. So, we're going to have a big season of growing new grass from seed. You can use it the best time for crabgrass, late October. Okay. Putting it down just before we kind of go into winter. You want to kind of get it started in the soil, and let it leach in, and then we're going to freeze over. Okay. As we wake up, it'll be in the soil, and we know the weeds are going to grow faster than the lawn. And that's the one reason we're going to go out on the lawn in the spring when it starts to get squishy and we kind of get that itch to get out there and rake stuff. Okay. We just want to put down the corn gluten so before put it the again. Persithia. Okay. Right, because it actually ends up having a cumulative effect mm-hmm. in the soil from the fall into the spring. So you get a stronger shield of it. And now it will kill anything. And this is why we don't want to do it like flat out in fall um, because the seeds are going to germinate in the spring and we want our grass seed to grow. So we have a nice shield and a barrier coming for the spring. So you can do it there in the spring. In general with corn gluten, you can use it any time of year. Any time of year when seeds are going to grow, it's a, like you said, it was a pre-emergent. So any seed that opens and absorbs this corn protein, their roots are going to fail and they're going to die. Okay. So I like to say people have a very small yard. They're like, well, do I need this much? Okay, no. Apply what you need to in your areas that you feel that you need. And if you know you're going to end up with some, and perhaps you go for a vacation or you know you have weeds that grow into the garden, you know, put it, sprinkle it right in your garden. It's going to feed the garden in your open soil areas. Oh. Right, are now have exposed to the corn protein for that okay. five to six weeks. Okay. And those weeds will try, and it can help you reduce that in your garden. You know what it, it just dawned on me, too, is I you always associate a weed killer, you know, quote-unquote killer, mm-hmm. with having to make contact with the foliage or the leaves of the, the plant to kill right. it. But this is an exception because it's the soil. So I think all along I'm thinking the corn gluten has to touch the leaves yeah. Of the corn of the of the crabgrass, but that's not the case. We really want the corn gluten to touch to just be absorbed in our soil, so you can use it in the gardens. Yeah, yeah. I never and thought of that. That would be good. So there's no harm in putting it in your garden. Nope, because it has no effect on established plants, and that's the one thing that right. people get confused about too. Is you put corn gluten down, but if you've got a field full of dandelions, it'll prevent the seeds from coming. But the established ones, nothing will happen. Ah. The adults have already grown past the phase. Of right. The corn or any other it. weed, creeping Charlie or something like that, that's already growing. Right. Any any seed that absorb or absorb it. So, yeah, throw it in your perennial garden. If you've got some little spaces you know are really tough that you always get weeds yes. in that back corner, throw some corn gluten down. Five or six weeks, you've got a shield against it. You're just trying to sell more corn gluten. Sell more <laughs> yeah. corn gluten. <laughs> Can you tell I work at a garden center? There you go. There you go. We need them as a sponsor, too. So there you go. So, um, so corn, yeah, so the corn gluten for the yeah. okay so <laughs> howard is written in and i think gary you need to save this email for me so thank you howard he says hi love your show joanne you are so funny thank you no one else in my life thinks that um <laughs> i can only imagine living in your neighborhood and the people see that you're you walking your dog saying oh no is that it 
is that weed lady hide. So, yes, I think. Um, you know what that reminds me of? I don't know if you've ever seen that English sitcom. Uh, um, what's that? Something Appearances with Hyacinth. Oh, Keeping Up Appearances. Keeping Up Appearances. That's a great show. Right? Did you ever see no. that? Oh, right. Oh, so and fun. every time they see Mrs. Bucket, but it's bouquet, right? Yeah. They say, oh, no, it's that bucket lady, right? Oh, no. So th- I can only picture uh, as well this guy saying, that's oh, funny Howard, that that's when funny. you're walking around, they say, oh, it's that water or weed lady yes, you know, with the water yes, bags yeah. and the weed. Look out, close. And they close. They all run in their house. Yeah. They close the windows and the doors, right? Yep. That's yeah. hilarious. Well, in my friends, because I was out for a walk with my girlfriend when we stopped to talk, and that's when I leaned over and I said, just a second, I'm like pulling out the, the, the dog strangling vine from where we were standing kind of thing. Yeah. And then my neighbors, too, they laugh at me when I put the tree bag on their uh, um, on their tree. But, the, <laughs> but the, the question is, yes. do they use it? They do. Yeah. Once Good. I tell them, like, they'll never, they don't seem to, haven't quite caught on the fact that their tree is dying of thirst and they yeah. say, call me and say, Joanne, can we borrow the bag? They haven't yeah. gotten them that far yet. Okay. But when I put it on their tree, they know to go and fill it up. So, good. Uh, so that <laughs> I'm is, glad so that about that. Good. Really? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I have another, another neighbor. Um, we both had, um, you know, I was saying my trees are so much farther ahead. So yeah. I, they, my next door neighbor on the other side has a ginkgo as a city tree, and the neighbor across the street has a ginkgo. Well, they got their ginkgos two years before I got my ginkgos, and you would never know it. In fact, mine is bigger. Like, it's the trunk and everything, and it is because of the water. So I did notice that my one next door neighbor, I thought, oh, I really want to give him, the lo- loan him the tree. But then you're not sure if you're going to be that bully, right, Howard? Thank you very much. But... Uh, you know, and then yet there's a tr- there's a house down the street that were too far away for me to bully, and they <laughs> completely neglected their tree. Oh. And when I went for a walk on Sunday, their tree is completely dead. That yep, was the one that was dead. replanted by the city. Yeah, it was replanted by the city. Um, t- you know, three years ago, and so for three That's years terrible. they nev- they didn't do a thing. They never watered that tree. That's terrible. So, uh, so See, yeah, and, and, people and so are, now that's their taxes, right? Like yeah, that's a that's tree right. that's not right. shading their house. That's yep. a tree that is not uh, providing Waste of money, you know. And so now somebody's got to come and dig it out. Somebody's got to put in a new tree, and and then you know. Although I do kind of blame my city because lots of most of the cities going back to the tree bag yet again. Most of the municipalities, except for Pickering, I'm sorry, I will I will say that to Pickering, mm-hmm. they will they provide you the bag with the tree. Oh, wow. Right? See, that's great. That's right? Isn't that awesome. wonderful? That's and wonderful. I know I was in Brooklyn when uh, a couple years ago I was doing an installation and uh, of a garden and they had just finished losing all their the, all their ash trees had been taken out. And so they were waiting. They said, oh, yeah, we're waiting. We, you know, they've been all flagged now. We know they're coming any day now. Well, that day, doesn't somebody drop off instructions and a bag and said, you know, your tree will be here in a few days. These are your instructions and here's your bag. Hello. Like, come on. See, right? that's a great that, idea. That, is, that you know, so that thirty dollars, forty dollars yeah. that it cost compared to replacing the tree, mm-hmm. yeah, because it wasn't looked after. Honestly, when so when you know when you had your trees re- replaced, um, regardless of a bag or not, did the city come around and leave like a, a something in the mailbox or the door saying? You know, we are replanting trees. Could you please water it? Or no, they, see? not at all. So not see, a word. This I, is I the mean, problem. I just knew, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course, you didn't know. But this is the problem. It's it's the same thing in this neighborhood. You know, a lot of people assume because it's city property. Right. Yes. And and you can't blame them. It's city property. They say, well, we, you know, it's nice to have a tree planted, and, it, and hopefully it's going to grow and let nature take its course. Mm-hmm. But they don't think they're responsible to water or do whatever. Now, the people with common sense yeah. would do something, but I blame the municipalities because even if you don't have a tree bag, at least when they replace those trees, the little memo on each door. Yeah. You know, yeah. this even though this is your tax dollars at work, we replaced it, it cost yeah. this and that. Can you please water, you know, and give instructions, yeah, right? Absolutely. What is I so agree. hard to make a five, six, seven hundred yeah. copies of that and put yeah. it where they're replacing That's trees? Nothing. Yeah. No, nothing. For sure. nothing. Nothing. And for they sure. don't do it. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. So everybody thinks, Oh yeah, we got the tree replaced, but they don't think to water it. Yeah. And and I know a lot of it, even cutting the grass, I know people do it begrudgingly and they think it's but you know, the trees, the neighborhoods that are tree lined, the value of their homes, mm. right? If you don't if you you live in a tree uh, street with trees, 
tree lined, like mature trees, the value on your house is more. Yep. Um, it depending on with the direction of the sun and the wind, you're saving yourself. That that city tree, quote unquote, is saving you. Right. Um, cooling the house, yep. warming the house in the winter, possibly um, breaking up the wind. Like there's a lot of things that those trees get do, and are you know they're not free. They are we are paying for them. Yep. So. All right. So save that. Save. Save Howie's email for me. I'm going to frame that one. I, he thought it was fun. I'll so save it for great. you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, there's a watering rant today, but uh, lots of challenges in the August garden. And we know everybody, it's hot and tired, and I just want to soak and float in my pool too, or you want to stay inside in the air conditioning and read a book. You don't want to get out there. So, um, But there, you know, I think things like the tree bag, things like staying on top of the weeds, um, you know, being proactive with mm-hmm. the... Um, Corn gluten. Uh, thank you. Corn gluten. Um, the ch- the traps, excuse me, for the Japanese beetle. That's something like those are all things you can do that kind of work for you. Right. right. So that we're not having to out, be out there. Right. Right. Lower your maintenance and the time exactly. spent in the yard. Exactly. Yeah. Spend exactly. it, but spend it favorably to you. Yeah. So anything else? Um, you know, I think remembering to when it is cooler, um, p- our plants start to... Um, <laughs> our plants start to look a little tired so but many of them can be rejuvenated right mm-hmm. uh but like a lot of the perennials can if we trim them back um i was at a site visit prior to the show tonight um a garden we put in last year and it's looking great but her sal- purple salvia were most of them were starting to kind of be done so i you know i so- showed her how we can you trim the stems and I'm meaning to, I haven't done my own because I've been meaning to do a video of me doing it. So, uh, but it's been too sunny <laughs> yes. and hot. And but hot. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, so there's a lot of perennials that if you deadhead them, they will rejuvenate. And right. so you're going to get that second in August, especially late July. If you do that by August, you are going to get new flowers. Yes, new flowers, mm-hmm. even new foliage, things right. like cucurus, right? You get that mm-hmm. second layer growing up through it. The uh, cranes build, perennial cranes build. There's a second layer that starts to flush right. up. Yep, so you can give them just a little haircut and look them good again. Yeah, excellent. Yes. Yeah, that's good. And what else can we do to help? Um, y- you know, we talked about the ch- iron chain late. Should we be still, do we need to? fertilize or compost like we're kind of past that right yeah as we get into late august we're going to start thinking about putting new soils new compost as we get through into fall Mm -hmm. and that's also more of a september thing as well but yeah you don't need to be doing the high nitrogen fertilizers and blasting them to them keep your annuals fed you know with a high middle number of good phosphorus keep them blooming and looking okay i do have to say one thing i i do like i'm you know we've talked before i'm not a super annual fan and i know every Everybody loves their containers by the front door, but I have to say, I and when I bought them or I use a lot of perennials or shrubs, sometimes I mix it up every year mm. of my things by the front door. But I know the annuals do need that fertilizer, and you have to remember. And because you're watering it so much, you're diluting it and stuff like that. This year, I went with tropicals. I did the diplodenia. Diplodenia. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Honest to goodness, barely paying attention to it. Totally dries oh, yeah. out ignoring it and everybody's like what the heck is that <laughs> and so i mean i put in sp- so i've got white ones and i put in some spider plants i put in a variegated ivy green and white I just went all green and white and honest to goodness yep very little attention i think the least amount that i've ever paid um and i've watered that like i've even kind of like watered them out of guilt like oh my goodness <laughs> i haven't watered these yep. but you would never have known it like by looking at it so i think sometimes the the tropicals are a little pricier Yes. In the spring when you're kind of comparing them to your geraniums or to your other annuals. Correct. Uh, and your begonias, that type of thing. Although in, if you have shade, then definitely go for the begonias. But if you've got a hot, dry sun and you can't keep your containers uh, watered enough um, and looking good, then I think spend that extra money and get a diplodenia, get a... There's a couple others that have escaped my head. Anything like Mandevilla. Mandevilla. There's some crotons. Yeah. All sorts. There's a, a wide range. Yes. Flowering and foliage. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Exactly. So uh, shout out to the tropicals. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Another low maintenance. They come yeah. from climates which are hot and blazing. And yes. 
on and off wet and dry weather all the time. Yeah, those cottage people. Because honest to goodness, the, if everybody who has a cottage has to take their annuals and put them in the shade for the weekend and and stuff like that. Or they for come the home week. to dead plants. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just and then you feel like you're wasting. So yeah, you're you're spending a little bit more initially, but compared to the ones you're killing, <laughs> you know, go for it. So yeah. I think this show has been all about spending money, you know, on the <laughs> tree bag, okay. on Japanese beetle traps, and now on tropical plants. But <laughs> But uh, definitely, I just, I'm shocked at how much easier it has been. There you go. Yeah, and, even compared to when I've done perennials right. and shrubs in, in the pot. That's it. And remember, they're all tropicals. You can bring them inside for the winter. If you've got the space, Yeah. you can, you know, divide them up and bring them in. But, like, you probably will. Yeah. You probably won't. I probably bring them won't, in. yeah. But I don't have enough, because su- you still need sun inside, right? You need high indirect light usually. Yeah. Because most of the tropicals we get, they're they're grown under, like, a 50% shade cloth anyways. Yeah. Because... Um, when they're young, they'll freckle sometimes in the in growing in the, the direct sun like that. Right. But yeah, but like you will, and as I will, like you will not bring them in. Um, they're they're gonna die anyway. So yes. you may as well spend a little bit extra, and have this beautiful different, yeah, yeah. beautiful annual arrangement. So annuals don't have to be those the ones that you I think fear. Yes. The high or maintenance dis- or dislike. I don't fear, I don't okay. fear them, Matthew. You fear nothing. <laughs> you fear nothing. Let's fear put them. that straight. Well, I love my begonias, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, when you've worked in a nursery for a long time, as you yeah. can attest, our garden center, and you have to move them like every other oh, day, God. and you have mm. to color block them, and you have three different sizes of them and sell packs and, and four inch pots and six inch pots or 12 inch pots, you know, you kind of get tired of annuals. You do. <laughs> you they do. do. It's really a l- they are a lot of work. They yeah. are a lot of work. And you haven't even planted people. them yet. I know. <laughs> Oh, goodness gracious. Um, I can't believe we haven't had a lawn question. So as we're nearing the end of the show, we haven't had a lawn question. But our lawns are dormant. There's no need to fertilize. Just chill, right? And we'll talk more about our lawns probably in our September in the Garden episode. Yeah. Yeah, September Excellent. is going to be the best time to grow it, so we'll give you a good focus. And don't forget to check us out uh, on your favorite podcast app, right? That's we do right. have some lawn episodes and some September in the Gardens as well uh, that will do some lawn questions if you end up during the weeks yeah, where we're away. Yeah, we did quite a few. Yeah. yeah, some lawn episodes. So take so a look good. there too. Okay. Excellent. Sure. Excellent. What else do we, what else can we recommend? Oh, uh, what do we have left? What time do we've got? I know. We've got all these notes and all this wonderful information we want to share with you. But Yes. Um, we talked about watering deeply. Um, I guess, uh, you know. What, some stars. What it, We always like to end or touch base on some stars in the August Garden. So if you do identify yeah, with some you. holes maybe or where you, there's something's not blooming, I know the site visit I just did, she did have, you know, now that she's seen it grow in after a year, she said, she goes, I, I want more flowers, you know, because the hydrangeas are late and, and stuff. So she said, what else can I put in the garden? So there's some August stars of the garden, mm-hmm. right, that you've got for us? Yeah. Um, probably an obvious one, Rudebeckia. Right. There are lots of different sizes. Uh, the Goldstrom, if you're used to that classic four-foot Goldstrom, four foot by two and a half to three feet when she matures. Okay. There's little Goldstrom now. So it's uh, just a little dwarf one. It's about okay. 18 to 20 inches tall and about a, a foot and a half to two feet wide. And she'll do a nice border or, or uh, mid-ground kind of color. Nice okay. display. Perfect. Uh, one of the ones I like is Caryopteris. So it's a shrub. Mm-hmm. Um, nice blue flowers and silvery green leaves. Um, attracts the fall bees and uh, some food for those butterflies and other things. Excellent, excellent, and that kind of ties with the uh, butterfly bush. They I tend to be say, very similar. Very similar is yes. your butterfly bush. Lots mm-hmm. of color. Deadheading will keep them blooming. Right. Um, and just be patient with those in that they d- are dead sticks until July. Yes. Unfortunately, so they should be kind of at the back of the garden or something else blooming in front of them in the earlier in the season. Exactly. Right. So strategy. There's a little design tip for you. Strategy there. There you go. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, and much like our Rose of Sharon, right? They're, yes. They're beautiful. Also beautiful, but, but they like to sleep in. Yeah. So Ooh, that's a good way to put it. Don't get, don't give up on them yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, late to rise. Um, what else do we have? Their sedums are going to start to come in. Yeah, play. and the ornamental grasses too. So yeah. and the echinacea, purple cone flowers. So yeah, there's a lot that we can still. You know, that's looking good. So yeah. go, if there's holes in your garden, kind of go for a walk around and see what's blooming in other people's gardens. Sometimes yes. that's 
that's an easy way to see what you know what are your neighbors growing not that you want to grow the exact same thing like if you see echinacea or purple coneflower growing in your neighbor's garden and you can go to the garden center you don't have to get that same variety they're they're right. available in pink they're available in orange they're available in red now Green. i've got like a light yeah i've got a little orange one and a little red one and i've got my purple ones so you know so you can get some ideas that way because you know it's it's growing in that area Exactly, Mm -hmm. exactly. Check out your local parks and uh, botanic gardens too. Yeah. They'll always have lots of different and inspirational plants. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, Well, I wanted to update you a little bit on the garden walk. Did you have I know. We can't wrap it up yet, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, but I hope that helps everybody with their August in the Garden. If you have questions, you can certainly go to our website, my website at downtoearth.ca. We've done August in the Garden episodes the last couple of years, and we try to shake it up and, and kind of have a theme each year. But we may have covered stuff last year that we didn't cover this year. This year we kind of ho- uh, focused on the challenges. Yeah. So if you've got other questions, then please check out those podcasts. Exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. And you had an update for us on the garden. Yeah. Garden walk? So I did. So the garden walk Buffalo, we've had Jim Charlier on the show a couple times. He was on last year uh, prior to the, the walk. And the walk was this past weekend. So sorry, everybody, you missed it. Uh, it's the last. So plant put on your calendar for next year, though. So it's the last weekend in July. This was their 25th anniversary. And I really wanted to go. Um and uh, Jim's going to be on again because he did do a book. He and Sally Cunningham uh, did a book, which was lovely. And I have a copy and and it's very, very, very good book. It's ri- not just pictures, too. It's nice stories that go with all the gardens. Nice. So um, I was able to do a tour where we got to kind of see the preview. So we got to see gardens on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday prior to the garden walk. And the garden walk in the downtown core is definitely the weekend. But for the whole month of July, they have what they're called um, open gardens. So gardens that are a little further away from the city, more in the suburbs, like Hamburg and Am. Um, I'm going to butcher all the Buffalo suburbs, so I will stop <laughs> there. Um, and, uh, but you know, the garden, the gardeners will choose, you know, that they're open Thursday evenings or Wednesday mornings or something like that. So then you can nice. just kind of see the listing of the o- quote unquote open gardens and wander through them. And in most cases, the homeowners are home. Sometimes they're not. We had a couple um, where they left signs and notes on everything, but they were both working. So that was kind of cute. That is um, cute. So, yeah, so very eclectic, very different gardens, gardens at all different stages. Uh, so we got to see um, four private gardens on the Monday. We got to see, I think, two or three on the Tuesday morning. And then I spent the afternoon at the Frank Lloyd Wright um, Darwin Martin house and that they just did a whole restoration of the house and gardens and the gardens are officially opened the day before we got there so brand nice. brand new garden so three years I think it's going to look amazing to see what they look like and then on the Wednesday we did get into Buffalo and we had five homes on one street and three homes on another street so the bus dropped us off and we had you know, an hour to kind of wander around and look at the at the neighborhood and look at the back, what people did with their front and backyards and really in- innovative tiny yards in many cases, a lot of concrete in many cases um, and just what they did with them. So, yeah, so it was good. So, like I said, I did share lots of photos on my uh, Facebook page and a little bit on Instagram. And I will if I get organized and have time, I will share some more. <laughs> um, lots of interesting water features. You know, you picked up something, a lot of garden and the art, a lot of garden in uh, art in their gardens, a lot of whimsy in their gardens. Yeah. Um, you That's know, that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I think it was really, you know, it can be, it's nice. It's, it's a nice thing to do. And so I think I saw a lot of pictures of how busy it was this past weekend. Um, and I'd like to try I mean, as much as I definitely recommend going ahead of time on a tour and, and seeing, seeing things without the crowds. I think it'd also be fun to be in the midst of those crowds too. So yes. highly recommended. I'm looking forward to having Jim on the show to talk about his book. Yes. That'll be and exciting. Yeah, definitely go uh, t- check that out. Excellent. So I think we're at the very top of the hour. We're I cutting think it so close. too. Gary's so gonna we'll start the music, up. right? The guys are waiting. Gary's gonna start the music anytime now. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Elise, Bob, Brian, uh, Chris, Jody, Don, and Howard. Thank you, Gary, for producing the show. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in this evening uh, here at uh, Down the Garden Path with Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. That's right. On Reality Radio 101. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to Down the Garden Path with your host, Joanne Shaw, and Matthew Dressing right here 
on Reality Radio 101.